on New Year's Eve of 1993, we're at some Baptist friend's house, and they were trying to save us from our lunacy. <laughs> they saw the direction we were going, and as we talked, he sa I said to him, Jim, you and I believe in the Bible alone, but do you realize that if you and I had seen Jesus crucified and raised from the dead, if we were there in Jerusalem, we would have never read the Gospel of John. How would we have known how to be saved, how to live our lives, how anything about God? Jim, we would have never read the Gospel of John. And he says, why not? <laughs> and I said, because it wasn't written until about 100 A.D. and we would have been worm food long before that. How would we have known Jim without the New Testament? And I'm driving home that night in the dark and I said to Janet, this is getting very scary. And she says, what's getting scary, Steve? And I said, the more we argue against the Catholic Church, the more I find myself backing right in the front door. See, you all came in forwards. My wife and I came in backwards. <laughs> And the next day we were studying. We had all the books out on the living room floor. I was sitting on the floor reading about apostolic succession. Janet was sitting on the couch reading about Mary. And all of a sudden at 2 o'clock in the afternoon I was completely overcome. I closed my books and I started to sob like a baby on sitting on the floor. And my wife said, Steve, what's wrong? And I said, nothing's wrong. I'm a Catholic. <laughs> and at that point, 1994... Neither Janet nor I had ever been inside of a Catholic church out of principle. We had never met a Catholic priest. We had never once met a Catholic who could explain or defend their faith. I read my way into the Catholic church. And I called my friend Al Cresta, who I would called stupid a year earlier, and I said, Happy New Year! Guess what? I'm a Catholic! <laughs> and he says, Nothing. Hello? Are you there? What did you say? I'm a Catholic. You're the last person in the world I thought I'd ever hear say that. What happened? Well, it was Saturday, and he said to me, Tomorrow's Sunday. How would you like to go to Mass with us? It had never dawned on me that if I was going to read my way into the Catholic Church, I'd end up having to go someday to a Catholic Mass. <laughs> and I knew what you did in there. You worship bread. Statues. Now, I understood intellectually that the church was right. But you have to understand that with 39 years of baggage and sentiments and things, they don't die easy. The rationality, your mind can say one thing, but all your old memories and your emotions say something else. I remember after becoming a Catholic, for three years I had terrible nightmares after becoming a Catholic. And I'd be tossing in bed and sweating and my wife would wake me up and say, Steve, Steve, you're having a bad nightmare. What were you dreaming? I said, oh, oh my God, I just dre I dreamt we'd become Catholics. <laughs> and she said, we did. And I'd think for her, go, oh yeah. Praise the Lord! And I went back to sleep. But this was how traumatic it was. Well, we went to Mass that Sunday, and we, I, my, by, my, by the way, my wife, I said to her, I covered the phone, Al wants us to go to Mass with him, what should I say? She's quick. She said, tell them that we're going to go, but we're going to leave the kids at home. We're going to get there late. We're sitting in the back row, and we're going to leave early. And people said we are real American Catholics from the first day. <laughs> But I never leave a Mass early. The first person that ever got up and left the Lord's Supper early was Judas. And I'm not going to be like him. And if nothing else, I would not leave a Mass early out of respect for the priest and the holy sacrifice of the Mass. The only reason I'd leave early is to stand in the back and shake hands with other people leaving early and say, See you next week, Judas. Goodbye, Judas. Goodbye, Judas. <laughs> so we went to that Mass... And Al did not keep his promise. We sat in the second row, and I was on the aisle, and everybody stood up. And I thought somebody had died in the middle. Why were they all standing up looking back? Nobody did this in any of our churches. We went. I thought somebody was laying dead in the aisle. So I turned around and looked back, too. And it wasn't any problem. The priest was coming up the aisle. And for the first time in my life, I saw an apostolic man. I had known good preachers and Bible teachers and evangelists, but I had never met or seen an apostolic man. 
all the way through ordination back to the apostles. And when he came up the aisle, I knew exactly who he was, and I knew what he was, even though I'd never met him or didn't know his name. I knew he was a Catholic priest in the apostolic succession, and I started to cry again for the second time in two days, and I wept through that whole Mass, and I looked at my wife Janet, and she was crying too, and she cried through the whole Mass, and we cried at every Sunday Mass for the next six years. And I said, this is terrible. <laughs> Somebody said, it's a gift. I don't like this gift. <laughs> the Holy Spirit should give me another gift that doesn't match my image at all. Crying all the time. <laughs> Becoming a Catholic made a big crybaby out of our family. <laughs> Went to the priest after and I said, Father Ed, Father Ed, we became Catholics yesterday. We want to join this church this week because we want to be here for the Eucharist next Sunday. <laughs> And he said, that's not how it works around here. <laughs> Something about RCIA? Two years from now on Easter? Well, I drove the poor priest crazy. To make a long story short, I called him almost every day. Every priest here is lucky I'm not in their parish. And he <laughs> finally says, come on in, gave us a test, and then called back and said, how would you like to come in on Pentecost? And we came in on Pentecost of 1994, the best thing our family ever did, all of us. My daughter, Cindy, was 16 years old, and she said, Dad, I am not going to join with you. And I said, why not? And she said, because you taught us too good before. So I had just written a letter to my dad. He was so angry at me, he clenched his fist and goes, How could you even think about becoming a Catholic? You must be living in sin or something. And so I sat down on the computer at night and I started a letter. Dear Mom and Dad, you're the best parents in the whole world. I owe you an explanation. And I typed and I typed for a couple days. And then when I, my letter was done, it was all printed out. I said to my daughter, Cindy, and my son, Jesse, who are 13, she's 16 now, a PhD in philosophy. Her husband's a PhD in theology. And I said to her, would you take this letter that I just wrote for grandpa and would you proofread it for me? She took it upstairs and she read it. She didn't even come down for dinner. At 10 o'clock at night, she came down with tears running down her eyes and said, Dad, I'm going to join with you after that letter, and I talked to Jesse, and he's going to too. So all four of our kids came into the church with us that day. Now that letter I wrote to my dad was never meant to be a book, but it ended up being this, Crossing the Tiber. This is our conversion story, and it's the story of how we struggled with the issues of scripture and tradition, baptism and the Eucharist. It's got all the biblical and the patristic, the fathers of the church in there. And it's been very helpful to a lot of people. Even the guy that's arguing with my daughter right now, who she's babysitting for, she gave him a copy two days ago. He said, I've already read half of it. He says, I think I want to talk to your dad. So I said, oh good, let's have lunch. But anyway, that's how that book came about. And we all joined the church together and it was the best thing we ever did. And then it was like getting on a roller coaster. I've never gotten off the roller coaster since and I couldn't be happier being a Catholic. Now I I have just three minutes left and I want to just tell you how I understand Catholic and Protestant because it has helped a lot of people get a grasp of how do you think about Catholics. Are we proud and arrogant and pompous and think we're the only right religion and everybody else is wrong? How do you think about Protestant and Catholic? I was an anti-Catholic. I went after the Catholics. Bolt barrels. Boom. Now am I an anti-Protestant? How do I think of myself now? Okay, here's a quick analogy. I laid in bed one night and said, Lord, how do I think about this? How do I explain it to people? And this image came to my mind of a ship and a raft, or rafts, plural. The founder of a country, he's building a new country over on the other side of the ocean, and he builds this beautiful city called the Celestial City. And then he comes back to the old country and he builds a beautiful ship. And he invites people to come and be, join him to go across the ocean to his new city and become citizens of the celestial city. And the ocean across is time. The celestial city is heaven. And he comes back here to earth to talk to us and say, how many of you would like to come with me on this ship to the other side? Oh, he's got a bunch of takers and we all get on the ship. And on the ship, he explains, now I've got a captain and a crew. I've got navigational equipment and maps and charts. I have water and food and showers and everything that you're going to need to get across to the other side. The ship is the Catholic Church. The captain is the Pope. The crew are the clergy, the bishops. The water is baptism. The food is the Eucharist. And what do you think the showers are? Confession. 
The maps and the charts are the Bible. The GPS and the, and the uh, other things are the tradition. Everything we need to get across. We're all on the ship. He comes and he gives us a warning though. He says, before you go, I need to tell you something and you get a second chance to get off if you want. He says, but when we go across, there's going to be storms. There are going to be centuries where the ship is tossed back and forth and you're going to get seasick, many of you. And you're going to maybe wish you were in the, think you were in the wrong place and maybe you made a mistake because the ship is going to toss at times through the ocean of time and you're going to get seasick and think it was a mistake. And there are other times where you're going to find out that some of the men in charge aren't always as good as I hope they'd be. They're going to, some of them, be too bossy or not even live their lives right. And even among the people here, some aren't going to take their showers and are going to start to stink. <laughs> but the promise is, as long as you stay with the ship, I'll get you to the other side. And so he smashes the champagne bottle psh, over the ship. It's christened the Catholic Church and off she goes through the centuries. And the ship is going through the ocean. We're all singing hallelujah, praise the Lord, as it was in the beginning is now and ever shall be world without end. Amen. And we're going along and halfway across through the centuries. Some people get disgruntled and say, who is that captain to tell me what I can do and what I can't do? Even in my own bedroom, he has no business telling me what to do. And I'm sick and tired of this bossy crew always telling us all these things of morals and this and that. And some of the people stink around here. They don't take their showers and I'm getting tired of this ship. Same old food all the time. And they go to the bottom of the ship and they find wood and they find ropes and they lash them together and they make rafts. And they go up on the top of the deck and they throw the rafts off the side of the ship and they all jump off onto their rafts. How many rafts are now floating around the ship? About 35,000 Protestant denominations and other groups. The closer those ships, those rafts stay to the ship, the better chance they have to get to the other side. The farther they drift off in the distance, the less chance they have to get to the other side. And everything good they have on the raft, where did they get it from? From the Catholic Church. Everything good I had as a Protestant, all the things I affirmed, the de definition of the Trinity, even the word Trinity, had been hammered out by Catholic councils for the first five centuries. The books of the New Testament, which I used to beat over your head, I got from the councils of the Catholic Church. All the things I had good on my raft, I had gotten from the Catholic Church, from the ship. And then I realized that I was not one that jumped off the ship onto a raft. I was born on a raft. I didn't even know there was a ship. And then one day I'm looking out over the horizon and I see this big thing over there. And I say to the people on my raft, what is that thing over there? We don't want to talk about it. I yell to the other, hey, over there, you, what, what is that thing over there on the horizon? We don't want to talk about it. Why not? Because it's the ship. <laughs> ship? What you talking about ship? If there's a ship, why am I on a raft? <laughs> and I think the founder of a country, if he's going to build a country and get a bunch of people over, would he be smarter to build a ship? and put them all in one ship and go across, or 35,000 rafts and stay, stay as close as you can together, try to help each other, and we'll see if you can get you all to the other side. What would the founder of a country do? He'd build a ship. Oh, my wife and I do our homework, and we research a little of our history, and I decide, guess what? I'm getting back on that ship. And in 1994, May 22nd, my wife and I got back on the ship, the Catholic Church. Now I go to the captain of the ship, and I say, Captain, I know those people out there. They are Protestants. You know, we pro pronounce it wrong. We say Protestant. It's really Protestant. Out there, they're Protestants. Those are rebels. I know them. I used to be with them. They're against you. Let's load up the cannons and blast them out of the water. Pew, pew, pew. <laughs> this is not what I say. Because out there on those rafts are my mom and my dad. And I know they love the founder of the country as much as I do. My mom and dad are 91 and 89 right now, celebrating their 71st wedding anniversary in next month. And they read and study their Bible and pray the first hour of every day. And my dad, the most common words on his lips are, Lord, I'm old, I'm ready to come home, come get me anytime. They're out on a raft, but they love the founder of the country. These people on the rafts, not all of them, but many of them have been baptized, recite the creed, and are willing to shed their blood as martyrs for Jesus Christ. So what I do is say to the captain, 
Put the cannons away. What I want is the loudest megaphone you have on this ship because I'm going to spend the rest of my life on the deck of the ship saying, attention, attention, all of you on the rafts, can you hear me? I found something on the, ra on the ship and I'm inviting you to all come back. I used to be on a raft, I know. Come back to the ship. And this is what my wife and I have dedicated our life to doing. I am not better than the Protestants. Sometimes they sing better than I do. Sometimes they obey better than I do. But I have found the fullness of the faith in the Catholic Church. Those are my brothers and sisters. They're also part of the kingdom. I want them back on the ship so that we're all on the same place together. And I am convinced that when I became a Catholic, a lot of even priests and seminarians came to me and said, Steve, we're so excited and happy you're Catholic, but can you tone it down a little bit? You're being very unecumenically sensitive with the Protestants. Tone it down. I just got back on the ship, and you want me not to tell them about the ship? Let's talk about what ecumenism means. But anyway, my goal now is that I do not view evangelism to have stopped when somebody finds Jesus. Evangelism stops when all of us who know Jesus are at one house, at one table, eating one meal together called the Eucharist. God bless you all. Thank you. I just love being with all of you guys. I just love to share the truth, and I love Jesus and the church, and it's so exciting. And I love being with folks like you who I know if the Roman soldiers ever came marching up here and said, deny Jesus Christ or I'll cut off your heads, there would be a huge pile of heads here. I love being with people who are willing to be martyrs for Jesus Christ. And I tell my children that I want you to raise my grandchildren to be martyrs because there's nothing more important than loving Jesus. And there's going to come a time with my grandchildren, I'm afraid, in this country where they're going to have to make a decision for their own life or to go the way of the world. And I want my grandchildren to know there's nothing more important than loving Jesus' church, even if you have to give up your life to do it. 